Do you read Stephen King? Good news, there's a club for you. The Losers Club. And guess what? You don't have to die at the hands of a shape-shifting clown to join. No, all you have to do is tune in every Friday as us losers journey through the never-ending wastelands of King's Dominion. Each week, we'll either spend hours reading between the pages of one of his books or chew on his latest tweets and Hollywood headlines. What's more, we're always having guests over. Thomas Jane, Mick Garris, Jerry O'Connell, Mary Lambert, Will Wheaton, and the list goes on. So what are you waiting for? Join us as we read on through long days and pleasant nights. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with. It's an audio interview series presented by WFPK Independent Louisville at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. Take a second before we get started, uh, wherever you're listening from right now, to hit the subscribe button. And that means if you're checking us out on YouTube, uh, wherever you get your favorite podcasts from, or if you're listening on Spotify, you can hit follow along there as well. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today, my guest, John McCauley from the band Deer Tick. They've just announced a, a compilation called Mayonnaise, sort of a companion to their last two records, Volume 1 and 2, which takes some uh, alternate tunes from those two records, uh, as well as uh, four new songs and some covers from bands like the Velvet Underground, the Pogues, George Harrison, and Ben Vaughn. And speaking of covers, we're going to talk about John fronting the band Nirvana, both in the Deer Tick version, Deer Vana, and as well as actually fronting Nirvana during their Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction and the recent Cal Jam. There's also some discussions on what it's like to be a band like Deer Tick playing in festivals in the middle of the day, their upcoming work for an unannounced documentary, and his uh, home studio that he's just built. It's Kyle Meredith with Deer Tick. Hi, uh, this is John McCauley. Well, first off, uh, so, so the new record is Mayonnaise, uh, which is automatically a fun title, uh, if anything. Following the, uh, the the condiments theme of, of late, is that right? Yeah. I, I don't know if we'll ever be able to break free from this trend now. It's just it's too much fun. I see the video and and there you are all dressed uh you know in in the in in the condiment costumes and whatnot and I'm thinking like how timely with the Kanye SNL thing you know having happened just a, a few weeks ago uh something in the zeitgeist or just a nice coincidence I don't watch much TV so I have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> Yeah he uh he came out on SNL and he was um he was dressed as the uh the Perrier bottle and 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 one of his cohorts was also dressed in something like and they did the entire video to it Oh he might be in the in the midst of some kind of crisis from what I <laughs> Yeah. Understand. Well, anyway, there's uh, th- there happens to be something about the condiments in the air right now. So, for what it's worth, I guess. Yeah. Well. Uh, now, yeah. Now. Um. Yeah. I guess there were a couple Instagram comments that went over my head, but now they make sense. <laughs> Well, on to more serious subjects with this record, anyway. So this, uh, it, it's not a, it's not an uh, an album album, or, or would you say it is? I guess it's being touted as more of a compilation, right? Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, we recorded a couple of new songs and some covers for it. Um, we just we had a lot of material uh, left over from volumes one and two, including some alternate versions of songs that from the sessions we did before we ended up recording volume one and two, we ended up kind of scrapping everything, but there were a cool, there were a few cool early versions of songs in there that we thought might be worth putting out. And uh, yeah, it's just kind of a mixed bag of deer tick stuff from the past few years, but it flows pretty nicely together it doesn't sound uh there's not too many drastic changes in sound quality or anything between songs it's pretty cohesive i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't call it anything other than a compilation though <laughs> gotcha. that's, that's really what it is yeah, i was thinking of those alternate versions and and uh, you know researching this interview at the same time that the new dylan bootleg just came out with you know more blood more tracks and uh, you know and there there's a guy who's who's famous for doing just you know so many different versions of one song and 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 I don't that that yeah, sort of blows you're me. You're not a Ian goes to see Bob Dylan every chance that he gets. He's a he's a, one of the biggest Dylan fans that I know. And uh, yeah, unless you're a really hardcore Dylan fanatic like my bandmate Ian, I think you might you might not be able to figure out what song he's playing until about halfway through it. But. That's true. But but you know, as a songwriter though, when you do those, because I don't know that every songwriter does that, and 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 I don't know to what extent how often you all do that. You know, different versions, alternate versions, or whatever of, of a song. But 
But in the end, I don't know. It, it almost seems like choosing, you know, which path on a road, left or right, is going to be the right one. Like, which one of these best represents our artistic vision? Is that what it is? You no. Know, well, with the with a couple of alternate versions that we put on mayonnaise, they were uh, there's two songs from Volume One. Two that I think were kind of overlooked. They don't really get mentioned much or requested at <laughs> shows. <laughs> And Volume One being the acoustic album, uh, the early versions of them were were electric and uh, maybe a little bit more, I don't know, they were just different than what we ended up releasing. And they were different enough that, you know, I thought it was interesting. And I, I just wanted to show that, you know, we did... We did struggle with figuring out (laughs) where to place some of the songs on volumes one and two because many of the songs could have been interpreted either as an acoustic song or an electric song. Now then you've also got the new songs on there are... Like, like, you know, we hear Hey Ya yeah, now. Are these all recently written songs or had they been around for a while as well and just unreleased? No, those are, uh, those are recent. That was um, when we went in to record the covers. While we were in the studio, we thought, you know, hey, we're all here. Why don't we write a couple new songs together and maybe we'll like them enough to put them out. Where does that, uh, where does that first single come from? Is there, is there any cool story behind Hey Ya? Yeah? That little riff on the, uh, on the a really low-tuned guitar was just something that I was always playing at sound checks and stuff. It was just this thing that I guess how, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, like, it's like my sweet child of mine. <laughs> you know, like the intro, is, the intro is just like Slash's warm-up, you know? And mm-hmm. then Axel was like, hey, we gotta, we got to turn that into a song. <laughs> well, it worked out well for him, so it's... Uh... <laughs> I yeah, love this I song, too. I don't know we'll have... Quite the quite the amount of success is that song. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun song though. It compliments, you know, right there. Uh, it's kind of one of those. I mean, we're big fans of of Deer Tick anyway. I, I think we've played just about everything you guys have ever put out. So, <laughs> you know, this is a uh, it's no different from Thank that one. But, yeah, but it's a, it's a seriously fun song and and you know, sort of what makes this this compilation its own thing, too. And it, But it, you, you talk about the covers it being the third part of this, you know, there's the alternate tunes, there's the new songs, and there's also the covers. I see we've got covers from uh, the Velvet Undergrounds, the Pogues, uh, George Harrison, that one's out there right now. And then there's another fella, Ben Vaughn, who I guess he's been around for a while. This is the one I wasn't familiar with, though. What's his story? Yeah, well, I first got turned on to his music from that album, Cubist Blues, with uh, Alex Tilton and Alan Vega. Ben's the uh, third part of uh, of that album that, you know, his name's on the record cover, but nobody ever really talks about his contribution <laughs> to that pretty amazing album. So I just started, you know, looking looking up his music, and, you know, I saw that Marshall Crenshaw had recorded one of his songs, and, you know, it seemed like he had a bit of success as a songwriter and touring musician in, in the 80s. I don't know. I just kind of I got really into his catalog, and uh, yeah, I love that "Too Sensitive for This World" song that we covered. I started singing that actually um, just down the road from my house. My uh, my friend Jeff, who passed away, uh, owned this record store down in the corner, and uh, we uh, or we shared our, our love of our love of Ben Vaughn's music was something that we had. You know, we were both really intense about, and when he passed away i played that song at his uh memorial service and uh well and then a month later another friend of mine passed away and uh the song just kind of stuck with me and we made it a uh both of our live show yeah. for for a while there and uh yeah ben's a great writer he's a he's a great guy he, we've become friends recently and he's a, he's he's just the sweetest dude and uh he has a great radio show i think it started on xpn in philly mm-hmm. uh and, and now it's nationally syndicated it's called the many moods of ben vaughn it's like an hour long and it's just a really cool mixed playlist he plays all sorts of stuff and what a what a great way to to keep the friends that you've lost kind of top of mind you know as as that song now has its own place you know his own recorded place too yeah it's, that song uh you know kind of helped me move along uh with my life you know and uh you know it was a pretty rough couple months and that song helps me a lot you you'd done an interview, I guess, recently, and, and, and you were talking about the covers, and, and I think the line that jumped out at me is you said you were obsessed with learning other people's songs. Like, that's, yeah. that's <laughs> sort of been one of the things. Uh, is it, is there any, do, you, do you find that there's any reason for that? Like, you know, I, I've been thinking, like, um, 
I remember a long time ago reading something from Rivers from Weezer, and he would say he would learn other people's songs so he could learn how to deconstruct them to get the mathematics out of them. And of course, I don't sense that that's what you're getting at here, but I didn't know if there was sort of a reason why, as you put it, you obsessed with learning other people's songs. Yeah, I, I, I just think it's fun to follow in other guitarists and other singers' footsteps and, uh, you know, to try to recreate something to put your own spin on it. I don't know, it's just fun for me. It's like, uh, you know, I, with every song that I learn, you know, I can, I can always take something from it that I can apply to my own music in some way, whether it's some some maneuver on the guitar that never occurred to me before or just realizing that hey i like singing in this key you know i mean i always wanted to be in a band but i think before before that became the obsession i just i just wanted to have fun and, and play songs that i love you know so it's yeah it's just kind of like uh you know i still want to be i still want to be the kid in the garage just playing cover songs with his friends after school you know <laughs> in a way <laughs> Probably a nice little seg here to to the other thing that you've done lately, which is playing cover songs in a sense, but it's not just playing cover songs. And I'm talking about fronting Nirvana, and I'll put that two words in quotes: fronting Nirvana. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because as far as playing cover songs goes, uh, I don't know that you can beat that right there. <laughs> uh, I had a pretty good band behind me for that. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Let, you know, to, to paint this picture a little bit, you know, so Cal Jam, the Foo Fighters Festival happens a few weeks ago, and this is not the first time, but, but you know, there was a mini Nirvana reunion as much as they can, and, and you and Joan Jett uh, got up there and reprised your roles from what you had done at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, right? Yeah, I think Dave had been planning it for a while, in his head at least, but I didn't hear anything about it until about, I don't know, maybe four days before. <laughs> wow! Yeah, it was... I mean, I don't know, it's hard to uh, it's hard to talk about. It was uh, I was kind of just in shock <laughs> the whole time. You know, uh, um, yeah, it was really a, a, an honor to do it. I mean, Nirvana was and, and still is. You know, one of my favorite bands. I don't know that their their couple of records uh, that was you know that was my 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 bible for my teenage years. Yeah. So it's it's really it was really heavy stuff, you know, and, I, and just seeing how you know you could you could see that it was bringing up a lot of mixed emotions for for Dave and Chris. You know, when we were rehearsing the songs earlier that day, I just felt I don't know being in the middle of that. It's really a uh, really special place, and you know, it's something I'll never I'll never forget. And for you know, for for anyone who doesn't know, of course, Deer Tick has. It's history with uh, it's Dirvana. Is that what you called it? The, the, your own tribute yeah. version, right? And that goes back how long? Uh, yeah, that'll. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we haven't done one. In, we haven't done a Dirvana show in uh, five years. I don't think, but it was maybe seven or eight years ago. Or a, a friend of ours in Providence is a, a promoter. His name's Mike, and uh, he does all our shows up there. He was throwing himself a birthday party at one of the clubs that he books, and he came up with the idea of Nirvana. <laughs> like, will you, will you guys come play my birthday party and, and do a set of Nirvana songs? Because I think he he was at a show where we covered Breed or something like that. And uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, it was really fun. We just did it. You know, we thought it would just be that one time, and then somebody heard that we did it or some YouTube videos or whatever, and then people started uh you know asking us to play shows as Dirvana and we did uh we did one at South by Southwest because we thought it'd be really funny because it kind of completely goes against the idea of South by Southwest right you know? <laughs> like an already established band <laughs> coming in and, and playing a set full of cover songs <laughs> It's just kind of, you know, so we did that and that was, that ended up being kind of, kind of a high profile gig. And then we just started getting ridiculous offers from people to play shows as Nirvana and they were offering more money than your pick had ever gotten paid at a show. So that's when we decided to put it to rest and stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Once the money starts coming it's, in, uh, now it's time started, to stop. Yeah. It, it started to feel wrong. But then that's that's the jump. So and and eventually there you are, you know, in place of of Kurt Cobain himself. And as you're talking about, you know, being in that circle when when they're connecting, you know, they're reliving all of that, and and you just happen to be 
in, in one sense, the the bystander, you know, that, that's privy to this. I mean, I don't know. Is there a point where you have to kind of shut down the whole I'm a fan first and, and go totally pro on it? Are you even able to do that in that sense? At no point did I want my uh, inner fan to uh, take over. So, I mean, I don't know. When you're, you know, Chris and Dave and, and Pat are just really, they're really sweet guys and they're uh, completely normal. Mm-hmm. The people as, as far as rock and rollers go, you know, I mean, you know, I felt very comfortable with them. They didn't, uh, I don't know. There's nothing strange about them. You know, they didn't seem otherworldly or, or like, I don't know, anything that would, I don't know. It's, it's just play music with yeah. a couple of guys. That's interesting. Cause you know, I had, I had Joan, uh, Jet on my show just a couple weeks ago too, and and it, it's so funny how similar the things you're saying about them are. You know, just how down to earth and how the, at ease you know they can make a make another artist. You know, and, but especially in a situation like that, I think that's what's the most interesting about it. You know, it's and it was as a fan, it was fun to watch though. I mean, the, to see both of you all up there doing it, uh, you both did the song so much great service. You know, and to bring them to life when people have just wanted that for so long and. I think, um, you know, Grohl has gone to say that, you know, I don't think he by no means means to take this out on a, a world tour or anything, but but these might happen more so or something like that. And I don't know. I mean, are you are, are you still ready for that call? Is this something that you'll step in on whenever <laughs> you're asked to? Or is this have you had your moments? Uh, I, I mean, I, I'd love to play with them again. I mean, what I've learned is that when Dave Grohl sends you an email, you must respond to it. <laughs> <laughs> you must. Aside from that, um, <laughs> with that last record, and I'm going to stick because Cal, this is the seg, is the Cal Jam being a festival and, and have you all probably playing multiple festivals as bands do these days over the last summer. Uh, there was a song on this, uh, on Volume 1 and 2, called SMF, and I was wondering mm-hmm. if you got to play that directly at any festivals this year. We did. I don't think we played it at Cal Jam. We played it at Hardly Strictly Bluegrass in San Francisco. I think we did it at Newport Folk. I don't. I don't know. It's a fun, fun and funny song to play at festivals, and it's uh, you know usually uh, not directed at <laughs> whatever festival we're playing. But uh, I don't know. playing festivals is funny. It's uh, it's really not the ideal situation for bands like us. You know, like a forty-five minute set in the middle of the day. That's that's not that fun. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. yeah. No, I've I, I my I mean my favorite you know some of my favorite Deer Tick uh, concerts and I think I've seen a lot of them but I think when you really especially look at those early days uh, I couldn't have imagined any of those sets in the middle of the day <laughs> with the sun <laughs> out in the heat I don't know how that would have how that would have worked out Yeah, we did uh we did some very I don't know we used to play for a long time and drink way too many beers while we played and it was such a blast <laughs> <laughs> but it's different these days right i mean the the the, the uh the amount of alcohol i think has has uh has has receded i guess is that the right way to put it <laughs> uh, a little bit yeah yeah uh I, I mostly stick to uh miller light these days but uh yeah uh, it's still a, a part of our thing i mean we're kind of deer tick is synonymous with beer but <laughs> Yeah, I was actually thinking of this one show. I don't know why I was thinking about it yesterday. This one show we played in Santa Fe a long time ago. We had a 45-minute set. We were opening for somebody. And uh, in that 45 minutes, between the four of us, we drank 24 beers. (laughs) We completely emptied the case of beer in 45 minutes. It was like, you know, in between each song, drink an entire beer and play the next (laughs) one. I don't know how he. I don't know how he pulled it off. Sometimes human feats, right there. Uh, yeah, this is the first time I ever saw you was at Headliners here in Louisville, and uh, oh god, them darlings, I think was also on the bill with you all, and it was just, it was, it was in, it was, it was a total. I don't. I mean, I don't think anyone was was actually standing by the end of it. I mean, and I say that band or crowd, you know. But but somehow people were upright, and uh, you know, it's fun. It was a, it was a great show. They always are. Thanks. I did read about a couple things, and I'll close up here with that. Uh, I don't know if you can talk about it or not, but you said you guys were probably going to be doing music for an upcoming film. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't really know how much I can talk about it, but it's it's a documentary, and yeah, they, they were going to use some of our songs in it anyway, and then they just asked us if we would score it too. So we're going to start work on that 
in January. And, uh, yeah, hopefully you'll hear about it uh, sooner than later. Yeah. Have you ever scored before? It seems like this would be quite different if you haven't before. Uh, not really. I did a little bit of work for a documentary called Oxiana, but uh, I, I didn't score it in any sort of traditional way. I just kind of, you know, sat down with my guitar and played along to the movie as I watched it, you know. Yeah. Just kind of improvised. But, yeah, we're going to try to do it a little bit more in a traditional sense with this documentary. I can't wait to hear how that comes out. And uh, and how's the home studio coming along? Uh, actually, my wife is in there right now rehearsing for her uh, the show she's doing next month. So it's it's functioning. <laughs> <laughs> it's functioning. I know that. I mean, that's a major thing right there for any artist to be able to set up really one of those and, and make it work for them. So I... Uh... You know, hats off to you on that. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I never, I never paid much attention to what was going on while we were recording, so I didn't really pick up much in all my time in recording studios. So this is all new to me, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's a pretty involved thing. Well, man, good luck with that. Uh, and again, we'll be looking forward to the official release of Mayonnaise, which is f- in February, correct? Yeah. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to me again today. I really appreciate it, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll see you back down here in Louisville sooner than later. Of course. You take care. All right, you too. We'll see you around. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks to John McCauley from Deer Tick. Again, that record will be out in February. It's called Mayonnaise. If you haven't already, take that moment to hit the subscribe button right now, whether you're listening on YouTube, checking us out on Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts from, you can uh, subscribe there as well. After that, head over to wfpk.org. That's where I do a show every Monday through Thursday from noon to 3 Eastern, where you can also find some bonus episodes of this series. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network.